Welcome to the Omnibus Show, a program for people who are interested in everything, with deep conversations on a wide variety of subjects. And now your host, Dave Gibbs. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Omnibus Show, a program for people who are interested in everything, with deep conversations on a wide variety of subjects. Today's guest is Brian Frost who has been uh, a businessman in his career, and he has now just become the executive director of Actors Theatre of Indiana. And we have a lot to talk about today, because that that, that covers a a wide swath of life. Well, thank you. I'm pleased to be here. Well, Brian, it's great to have you here. Thank you. And you were originally from Plattsburgh in New York, and you are now a Hoosier. Exactly. Transplanted Hoosier. uh, grew up about an hour south of Montreal, so way up on the Adirondack Mountains. Okay. Used to ski at Whiteface Mountain. and Wonderful. Uh, so when I moved to Indiana, it was a little bit of a culture shock and a, uh, no mountains, but no appreciable bodies of water. But sure. uh, I made the adjustment over the last 50 years, so pleased to be here. And it's after 50 years, you've finally <laughs> been Hoosierfied, right? <laughs> exactly. But, uh, well, good. Well, in today's show, what was really interesting, what I, I think, because it's like you're, you're doing uh, some very different things, you've, you've had a finance and a real estate career, and you've become executive director for exactly. an actor's theater group uh, with creatives. So a businessman is now running a bunch of creatives. That just is a very interesting story. Um, for chapter one, could you please tell us about your story okay. and um, you know those timeline um, okay. stories along the way, and and how that you know how you develop because I guess technically, if you still would use the phrase, if you're retired, you're technically retired, but you're still working and you're doing this. So, because I always tell people that retire, it's like, what are you doing next? Exactly. You know, what's the next thing? I don't ever want to retire. But I think you've got an interesting story to, to share with us. And um, But please tell us about, uh, okay. about your story. Well, when I graduated from uh, Plattsburgh High School in 1968, there was uh, a lot going on. Yeah. There had been a number of political assassinations. You had the Vietnam War, uh, you know, racial strife, if you will. So first one in my family to head off to college. Went to Union College in Schenectady, New York. Mm-hmm. It was a private school. It was all men at the time. And things were going to change pretty dramatically in my first two years of college. Mm-hmm. Uh, you used to have a dress code where you had to wear a suit and tie to dinner, and that just did not last very long with uh, all the upheaval that was taking place in the counterculture and the hippies and all that. Mm-hmm. So when I got through uh, Union College, um, this was 1972, uh, I was accepted into the uh, MBA program at IU, so I went you know, hauled, got in my U-Haul and uh, drove down. At the time, uh, State Road 37 was a two-lane highway, so mm-hmm. um, spent a couple of years in uh, Bloomington, you know, getting my MBA. And my first job is actually after my first year of the MBA program, I took a summer internship program with the Urban League up in Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. Worked with uh, Sam Jones. The, they had a business development center, which was... Uh, Trying to implement, you know, black capitalism, if you will, and, and try and help uh, uh, blacks get into business for themselves. Mm-hmm. So I spent uh, a summer doing that, and then decided to go to work for him for a year. So I spent a year as the only white individual in a black organization, which was kind of an eye-opening. But it was fun because we were putting together spreadsheets to get loans and so forth. And this is obviously way before Excel or anything like that. Yeah. So we're doing it all by hand. But it was very rewarding. I had a great time doing it. And uh, after about a year and a half, took a job with another consulting firm. Uh, it was called Hyde Economic Research. And Beverly Hyde had uh, relationships with a number of banks. Because at the time, you had to do... Uh, uh, feasibility studies if you wanted to open up a branch of a bank. Mm-hmm. So you couldn't just do it. You had to show that there was a, a need for it. Mm-hmm. So that was 
you know, one niche of, of her business, and the other was uh, she had a contract with Indiana Bell Telephone. Oh, wow. And they were just getting into the retail business that uh, back then with Indiana Bell, you didn't own your phone. You were just leasing it. You leased but that's, that, it. I don't know if you remember. Hooked that, in that, the wall. Exactly. Yeah. But they had the Princess phone and Mickey Mouse phones, and uh, they were just establishing, like, uh, three-way calling things. Uh, that was an extra service mm-hmm. that you had to pay $3 a month for. So it was just a whole different environment. But they were There was interest- a Robin Williams mm-hmm. ad yeah. where it, they w- went into... Um, one of those retail shops, and he'd pick up a phone and have people have earth, you know, that <laughs> exactly. kind of thing. It was very, very funny yeah. and uh, had all the varieties. It was about that time. Yeah. So my assignment with her uh, firm there for a couple of years was to help Indiana Bell establish uh, where they wanted to put these retail stores. So I travel around the state and all the way from Evansville up to Gary and mm-hmm. Hammond and, and uh, so forth. To, uh, and they didn't want to go into the major malls, so I was looking for like the strip centers that oh, were near the mall. major malls. Right. And, you know, more t- uh, cost efficient to do it that cost way. Cost effective rental. Right. Exactly. And then, but because people are going to, since they leased it, they have to get it, so they're going to go get that anyway. Exactly. Whether they had to line up all the way down the street, or I, I see the economics in that. So, exactly. Yeah. So that's sort of sort of a consulting background. Uh, from there, I worked briefly for Indiana Bell directly. Realized I didn't really like the corporate kind of lifestyle, and mm-hmm. uh, and a friend of mine who worked for Western Electric, which did the manufacturing of the phones, had just become a stockbroker uh, with a firm called Robert Bayard and Company, based in Milwaukee. So at that time, I didn't know a stock from a bond. But uh, I went through a four-month training you were program. Involved in that, yeah, that, that regular retail with uh, the, the exactly. So this is a whole new world, and it was exciting. And yeah. at the time uh, when I started in 1982, the Dow was at 800. You know, we're close to 39 or 40 thousand now. Mm-hmm. So it's come a long way. It's changed way. quite a bit. But when I got started, mm-hmm. you know, I was doing cold calling. So you were literally calling people on the, the phone, phone book. To, and we would kid that if at that time there was no CNBC, there were no discount brokerages, and you know you you paid a commission anytime you bought or sold a stock. But you would kid that if you got somebody on the phone to talk about the stock market, you'd put them on hold and drive out to see them. So gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Not literally true, but it was almost that yeah. uh, case. No, I hear you. So anyway, I, I managed to spend uh, uh, 35 years in the financial services business. I worked for a variety of firms. Um, I worked for the Ohio company when it was purchased by Fifth Third Bank. Fifth Third Bank. The uh, numerically challenged bank. Yep. But uh, So I worked for them for 25 years till I finally wow. retired in, yeah. uh, in uh, 2017. And... Um, by then you were in Fishers, correct? Exactly. Yeah. And my wife is uh, in uh, real estate, so I got my real estate license. Uh, she doesn't really trust me to work with clients so much, but she'll <laughs> let me pick up checks and put up signs. Are you the man in the things. back e- office? Exactly. Yeah, there you I'm go. her IT consultant. <laughs> so, so I've done the uh, and her, real and her, estate. And her business is, or her office it, is. Yeah, she's uh, with Berkshire Hathaway, okay. the Fisher's office there. And she's been doing it for about 22 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, she had a corporate career selling uh, legs, hosiery, legs, eggs. And she did not like the corporate uh, structure, corporate lifestyle. Gotcha. And she found a job that uh, she loves. She's a people person, and has that's done the right very type well of person that, for that. That, for that real kind estate. of interesting, exactly. Yeah. And as I mentioned in in our talk before we came on, um, I have a cousin Ben who is with Berkshire Hathaway down in Nashville. And just loves it. Mm-hmm. So it's a very solid company. Um, Warren Buffett's exactly. the company that he is, has. And that's who Julian's with. So, yeah. yeah. Although she originally thought it was Jimmy Buffett. Jimmy but Buffett. I told her no. It was, uh, He's going, Buffett, so. going to go down <laughs> and have the corporate meetings down in the Caribbean, right? <laughs> there you go. Exactly. <laughs> that was the sure. draw, right? Um, well, that is fascinating. And then after retirement, but in the midst of all of this, 
you've you got involved with Actors Theater of Indiana, exactly, and you were the treasurer and you were a board member, and now you've become the executive director. Um, how does that? That's an interesting transition. Well, I, I know I know being part creative that creative people need businessmen exactly. if they're going to have a business because it their nature is kind of more on the creative side and there's that need for someone who who knows business and so and that's um, a relatively recent development it seems like yeah that uh, in the past it's been the artistic side that mm -hmm. ran the operation that ran the operation but a lot of arts organizations <clears throat> particularly after 2020 mm -hmm. and the uh, pandemic uh, you know, had to go out of business because they didn't have the financial expertise right. they and hadn't that done the fundraising. Wisdom and insight. Yeah. yeah. So this is in the the midst of um, retirement. Do you have any wisdom for those who are pivoting or who are going? You know, after they retire, or the the different. Um, uh, points that one goes on you know what's yeah. what do you how do you carry on yeah well this will be the uh, ted talk portion of our conversation oh okay and i'm stealing it from a, uh, a ted talk that i heard oh. a couple of years ago but it, it was really applicable to my situation i think and would be to a, a lot of people out there it just makes a lot of intuitive sense the, the the four phases of retirement you start off with the vacation phase that lasts maybe a year where you can wake up when you want to, you do what you want, you don't have any structure, you don't have any place to be at any given point in time. And you that, have breakfast all morning long. Exactly, <laughs> and then you can go have mimosas in the afternoon exactly. and you know whatever, and then you, it's just for about a year, you know, you wake up every morning with a smile on your face and you think, you know, this is great. And after about a year, uh, you start to think, well, is this all there is? And then you start to question, because particularly you were talking about like for men, that a lot of their self-worth, if you will, is tied in with what they did in their previous business career. So yeah. that's where a lot of their that's friends were, their with, activities, with guys. The, it's their, what you do. their you, structure. And, valued, I mean, f frankly, basically in our society, and perhaps it's universal, is that men are judged or valued by what you do. Exactly. And and that's something where eventually that would catch up with you, you know, sort of a sort of a thing. Yeah. So yeah. So, so that's a lot of times it's, two. it's it's that right. second phase where people start to get into trouble because they don't know uh, you know, they do feel uncomfortable, yeah, with what's next and what am I gonna do for another you know, it could be 20, 25, 30 years. So that's kind of uh, can be kind of daunting. But and so there can be depression, there can be, you know, difficulties, but if you can get through that phase, mm -hmm. you get to the third phase where you're doing more experimentation and you're starting to think in terms of, well, I'd really like to, you know, things you've thought about doing all your life. You want to take music lessons, mm -hmm. you start a book club, you join an exercise group, you, just, you know, uh, and in my case, I started playing tennis a lot. And oh, so you just nice. find things that you really want to do and that motivate you and excite you every morning to, to get up and get going. And then after you're through the third phase, the, according to the TED Talk, the, the, the fourth phase is the most rewarding, mm -hmm. and that's kind of the service to others where you find something that you do that brings value to somebody outside of yourself. And that's kind of how I see my... Uh, tenure here at Actors Theater is that I can bring the varied business skills that I've developed over the years mm -hmm. uh, and I can let the artistic people kind of do their thing because I have no artistic ability, I have no musical ability, but I could, I've got fortunately uh, between Judy and, and Darren have two great artistic people that I can work with. So my job is to kind of coordinate that, tie it in with the marketing group and uh, keep track of the finances. And I think we can provide the Broadway in your backyard here in Carmel like we have for going on 20 years now. Mm -hmm. And so it's a pretty exciting uh, the programs we have exciting coming up. Exciting project. Exactly. Well, that's fabulous. And um, I'm going to take a quick break, but we'll, we'll follow up on Chapter 2 on, on your ideas and 
and, and bringing business to theater there we go. for ATI. So we're going to take a brief break right now, and we'll be back with Chapter 2 with Brian Frost on The Omnibus Show. Hello and welcome back to The Omnibus Show. We're speaking today with Brian Frost, and he is bringing together um, in this chapter his uh, business experience and knowledge of all the time and all of the finance and real estate experience he's had and bringing that to um, the Actors Theater um, of Indiana and as executive director being the business mind that will take it to the next step. And so tell us, how do you, for people who are interested in, 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 in working the two with uh, the, the business side, you know, it's like right brain, left brain, and the creative. Right. Um, you've been on the board, you've been the treasurer, which is very helpful for a having a helpful. businessman. You need a businessman as the treasurer. And um, now as executive director, um, can you please tell us about how do you work with the creatives as the, you know, I mean, I'm talking about the whole time you've been on, you know, been right. on the board and such. How do you help creatives in, on the business side? Okay. Well, what we've done here in the last couple of weeks is start to establish some budgets. Mm -hmm. And rather than just doing it on an annual basis, I mean, we're trying to break it down month by month. So we try and make the artistic people a little more aware of, all right, here's what we have to work with. You know, how can we uh, d do it, you know, spend the funds most efficiently? Sure. And that ties in with the marketing program. You know, where do we get the most bang <clears throat> for the buck, if <clears throat> you will? But it's just trying to emphasize to the on the artistic side. They have their vision. We just need to make sure that we can provide the funding to uh, to make the vision into a reality and it's worked well so far uh, uh, Judy Fitzgerald uh, Darren Morell have been very receptive to that so we're working well together uh, as I say we're right in the middle of the budget process now for mm -hmm. fiscal year 2025 and we just finished up a very successful season um, we've got a, a very uh, you know a great upcoming season starting mm -hmm. in uh, in September so we're going to take the time between now and September to to focus more on the budgeting side sure uh, fundraising uh, we brought in the uh, new president of the of the board John M Murphy mm -hmm. who's had experience uh, with Ivy Tech he was a fundraiser for them uh, so he's got uh, the experience that I think we need to, to really emphasize fundraising. We've had support from uh, the Crystal ha DeHaan Foundation, uh, the City of Carmel, uh, UFB, United Fidelity Bank. So we've got good corporate support, so we're going to try and supplement that with more corporate support, try mm -hmm. to expand that, sure. and get uh, hopefully individual uh, contributions as well. Uh, you know, if you wanted to support one of the programs that we're putting on, uh, mm -hmm. we're doing Johnny Cash, we're going to do 9 to 5, we're doing a murder mystery, Who Done It? we're doing kind of a holiday love story. So I think we've got four really uh, programs that will do very well. I think uh, uh, the advertising we've got through uh, uh, um, Megan Associates that will be able to really uh, push the the program and increase the visibility. We here. know Meg. And, yeah, everybody <laughs> knows Meg. Uh, and she's the reason why I'm on the board, actually. Oh, so of course. She's the one who invited me initially, so I've appreciated that. Yeah. But the key is you have to have a great product, and I think we've got a great product to sell. We've got a marketing team to do it, and uh, Kristen Kepler is our uh, accountant slash uh, controller, mm -hmm. so she handles the financial side of things. So I'm trying to approach it with a business mentality. If you've got a great product and you've got great marketing and you can keep track of the finances, uh, there's no reason why you can't be successful, and I think we will be. Sure. I would think in your position with your business background and being the executive director, it's like Saturday morning 
dad taking the kids to a candy store, <laughs> really. And it's like, how, how do we get it all budgeted, if you will, to kind of flip the story? You're going on a vacation so we don't eat cornflakes for six months. Is Am I right? Yeah. And so um, that is that is really... What are a few insights that we could learn from you about... Um, working with with the creatives, like how do you? What are some key insights about um, working with a group of very creative people on, you know, how to keep the budget yeah. and how to how to focus on planning? Yes, you have to trust because a lot of people like really need that kind of knowledge when they're working on their projects. Yeah. Well, the key, I think, is you have to have the creative team that, that uh, you can trust to be able to pick out the uh, popular shows. Because mm-hmm. so I think in the past, we've focused more on maybe DEI themes and so forth. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that might work in New York City or Chicago or someplace. But I think we're trying to focus more on what would be popular in, you know, Carmel, Indiana. Sure. And... Uh, Fortunately, I've been able to, uh, you know, Jim Riley was the uh, executive director for a dozen years. Oh, yeah. And he managed to basically put this whole team in place. Oh, so okay. I've inherited yeah. that. Mm-hmm. And with the, the funding, you know, he dealt a lot with funding issues. And because of Crystal DeHaan and the, and the other, uh, you know, City of Carmel and so forth, I don't have the same financial pressures that he did. Mm-hmm. So... You know, my job is to kind of organize things, and communication is also a big key. So I've tried to get everybody on the same platform. Sure. So we're, we've now got emails with the board, and uh, everybody can access the the, uh, the files and, and so forth. So I think it's just a more efficient communication system. Uh, I think miscommunication in an organization can be fatal. So if you have everybody yeah, on board and yeah. everybody understands where you are, yeah. uh, we have now we're meeting uh, a couple times a month. We've got a marketing meeting, so mm-hmm. everybody you know gets to pitch their ideas. Uh, on the business side, we also meet you know, once or twice a month and start to go through the budgets. And uh, you know John Murphy really emphasizes, uh, you know. What are the metrics? What are we going to do to to measure whether the programs are successful? And it's easy to do with uh, performances because you can look at ticket sales, Mm -hmm. but it might be a little trickier on, well, how do you advertise those shows? You know, what do we do TV? Do we do Facebook? Do we do, I don't know, TikTok or whatever? So we're social media. Addre- yeah, social Reach. media. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So we're trying to address those issues as well. Mm-hmm. So we've got a lot of things. Uh, there's been, uh, you know, after COVID, uh, things have changed a lot. It's the, you know, I think the collective market is down probably 20, 25%. So we really need to work on uh, creating popular shows that people are excited about and uh, we've done very well now with season ticket sales over the last couple of months. So that uh, we're getting more staycation uh, ideas, aren't we? Because of the yeah. the nature of the inflation period that we're in. And the other thing we're trying to do is collaborate more with yeah. our, sort of our sister organizations. There are six resident oh, companies from the yeah. Center for the Performing Arts. So, mm-hmm. for example, now we're developing uh, some programs with the Carmel Symphony Orchestra. Mm. So we're going to be involved good. with them on July 3rd. Uh, at Cox Hall Gardens, and uh, we're going to do, I think, a George M. Cohan program, and then the symphony will play after that. So I think if we can uh, work with our uh, sister organizations here, I think we can you know, each get strengthened, more yeah. visibility. Yeah, yeah, no, that's some great ideas. Because, you know, uh, ATI has been around for 19 years, mm-hmm. but it's still not very well known, so we really need to rectify that. So we're trying to increase our visibility, and to the extent we can do that with other organizations like Carmel Symphony. Um, no, that, you know, that's, that's a that's really good, really good us. idea because that'll broaden your reach. Yeah. And um, Carmel Symphony has been around for a while, and having a symphony to 
interact with is, right. is a great, great well idea. one of the ideas we're resurrecting <clears throat> here and it's going to be on uh, july 27th so uh you know check on facebook to get more details but mm -hmm. we're going to put together uh, uh drive-in shows and that's what we did. Can you tell, in, what, what is a drive-in show? Do we get well, a hamburger with that and fries? <laughs> well, you bring Milkshake. your own, so you can stop oh, at Steak okay. and Shake oh, or uh, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, uh, in 2020, uh, Actors Theater was thinking outside the box. And since you couldn't be doing shows at the studio theater where we normally would, mm -hmm. we just put up a stage outside in a, in a parking lot uh, in, in Carmel and invited, you know, sold tickets, and you could bring as many people in your car as you could, and we parked them. About That's very nine, creative. Uh, parked them nine feet apart, so, you know, avoiding COVID and so forth. Sure. And did three of those shows over the course of uh, uh, about four months and actually made money. So that was a very successful Brilliant. venture. And so we're going to try that again, again on July 27th, and I think the CNO parking lot, so not too far from here. But uh, we're going to make that a, you know, a more exposure to the community, and uh, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Well, that sounds fun. Um, in the description notes, we will we'll put the link on Perfect. so that people can, can uh, click on there and... And look through, from their leisure, look through all the different programs sure. that you've got coming up. Now, you have aforementioned um, the shows coming on. Exactly. Uh, could you repeat that for us, yep. for the, the uh, crowd? And it's September it's 19th Cash, is opening uh, right? night for a Johnny Cash tribute. Okay. We actually have five Johnny Cashes. You have five. Who will... Uh, at various they walk ages. the line, I so, take yeah, it, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so at various phases in his life, we've got five different Johnny Cashes, so that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, I'd like to hear a five-year-old singing bass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stay tuned. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and then we're doing a, in uh, November a holiday love story, She Loves Me, uh, which is kind of like the She Got Mail plot. Oh, gotcha. So, yeah, so that'll be kind of fun. Oh, the... There's and then in chiclet uh, yeah, type of that, it's, 90s. That's a 90s phrase. Exactly. I think yeah. in February, uh, doing a murder mystery. It's called Who Done It. So that should be there fun. You go. And then the the uh, is that the, your your own creation? Is that ATI's own story, or is that is that some hidden Agatha Christie out there? Yeah, I, I'm trying to think who the playwright was, but no, it's pretty well known. Okay. For, yeah. Um, and then the fourth one is Nine to Five. So the, the Dolly the, Parton classic. I was going to say that movie, yeah. right? And the, the thing that will be fun about that is that the entire cast, all the back office, you know, uh, the lighting people, the sound people, they're all women. So it's, uh, you know, that should be a lot of fun. But, yeah, everybody loves 9 to 5, Johnny Cash. So Dan, I think we got Dan a very Coleman, exciting season. Wasn't that the, yeah. the, the, the yeah. man who's, I wonder how they're going to catapult him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, stay tuned. Stay so, tuned. Yeah. So okay. we've got a great season coming up. Yeah. And uh, we'll, I appreciate you having me on here to. Well, it's great to have you on. Publicize it. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Brian. And thank you also for because I think it'd be very helpful for many people in in learning about what well, you're talking about the phases of the retirement period. But what it's great seeing is that you're not retiring. You're just carrying on to your next. Exactly. projects exactly. and so um and that also is helpful for people who are pivoting because now i think in the younger generations um it's almost like you have to retire after three to five years working at a company mm -hmm. so you got to pivot and so this knowledge is helpful for people who are even younger who have to pivot and so forth Anybody can use that knowledge. And, and also, uh, congratulations for your new position at ATI. Thank you very much. And, uh, again, we'll, we'll put the link up on the description notes so that people can click in and um, see, you know, see ATI the show. ATIStage.org. ATIStage.org. Uh, yeah. And uh, so they can click there to follow up for getting tickets for the show. Very good. Great. Well, thank you, Brian. And that's it for today's episode of The Omnibus Show with Brian Frost, the new executive director with Actors Theatre of Indiana. And we'd like to thank our sponsor, Hotel Carmichael. We're recording today at Feinstein's. 
and we look forward to being with you on the next episode of The Omnibus Show. If you enjoyed this program, please like, share, and subscribe to continue the conversation. For The Omnibus Show newsletter, please sign up at theomnibusshow.com.